Good morning, everybody, and welcome to City Church. If you are a first-time visitor here today, uh, if you could just raise your hand, uh, we'll get you a red bag, um, and it'll. And then if you meet us at the the hub back there at the end of service, we'll get you a gift. Okay. <laughs> there's a um, there's a meeting we're gonna have. It's an annual business meeting. It's next week um, after church. It's for members only. So if you've taken a membership class and you are a member. Um, you can come to the annual business meeting. Uh, we'd like to have you there. Uh, there's a verse that I want to share with you guys this morning. Um, sometimes we can uh, we can come to church feeling unworthy. Um, and I just want to share with you, 1 Peter 2.9 says that, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so I just want to um, encourage you guys to proclaim the praises this morning and lift up your uh, voices to him. So Father, I just thank you so much for this day. I thank you that we can all come here to gather together. I just pray that you would um, receive our praises this morning with, uh, and it would bring joy to your heart, Lord. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
worthy, God. We bless you this morning, God. We praise you, God. We lift your mighty name up. God, you do all things well, God, and we know that you are for us, God, and you are not against us.
Thank you, God, that you speak to your church. God, that you are speaking to us. God, have your way in us, Lord God. God, mature us, God, in those areas where we need to be more mature. For those who are stuck, we know that you are so loving, Lord God, and you are right there, God, you are patient, and you are kind, and you are right there with us, Lord God, that, to unstick us, Lord. We thank you, God. We come to you with a humble heart, Lord God. Humble praise. And we thank you for what you are doing in our midst. God, as we are getting ready to receive the word, that our hearts are open, God. That our eyes will be open, God. And our ears will be open to hear your word and what you are saying to the church.
Got to get situated here. Got the wind today, huh? Got some clips in place here. Well, good morning, City Church. Good morning. It's good to see you here this morning. Glad those of you that are online are able to join us online. And um, as you can see, it's a bit of an adventure out here. Right? Someday we'll look back on this and they'll be like, hey, remember back in 2020 when we were having church outside and just getting pelted with acorns? Wasn't that great? Wasn't it awesome? I was giving Tori a hard time this morning because, um, you know, she was out here practicing, getting nailed. And, you know, like, uh, and she, I'd be like, hey, toughen up. Don't even, I'm not even worried about this right now. And... Finally, she looked and saw that I was actually standing underneath the eaves in complete safety, right? Talking trash to her. So, anyhow, yeah. And I think that was definitely a record today with uh, cymbal hits by Acorns, right? So, that wasn't just Todd's, like, odd inspiration for timing once in a while. That was that was a little assist by the by the trees this morning. So, but God is good, and I'm grateful for this for this good weather, even though there's a little wind today, I'm grateful for the blue skies and no smoke this morning and so glad that she could <laughs> so glad that you could be out here with us. Woo! Okay. <laughs> you get a little gun shy, don't you? <laughs> it's like there's another one coming. I know it's coming. But it's alright. I feel like preaching with an umbrella. Anyhow. Oh, all right. So, um, <laughs> let me see. Um, got some lemonade out there today. And for those of you who got the email, you know that um, we have this tremendous young guy who does our yard work. His company is called Edwards Mowing. And he's part of this entrepreneurial school kind of class project thing that they're doing right now. So to just kind of you know, create a model for formulating a business, they decided to do like an amplified lemonade stand and they made this, um, <laughs> they made this organic, you know, made with this special pH water or whatever lemonade, you know, factoring in the acidic levels and all this stuff. And then they sweetened it with local honey and just really put a ton of work into this. But, um, I haven't tasted it. <laughs> and for those of you who have this morning, I heard it's pretty uh, pretty special, right? So it's definitely, you know, what we will say for it, though, is it is organic, all right? So um, I heard it's super bitter. So um, Jackie tasted it this morning. She's like, well, that's interesting. And I'm like, well, she's kind of picky. And then Jeremiah tasted it. He's all that's really interesting. And I'm like, okay. And Jackie's all, you want me just to go get a bunch of sugar packets from the coffee bar and dump them in there? <laughs> I said, no, don't do that. We told everybody it's all organic and stuff. So anyways, <laughs> we maybe need to kind of put the Kool-Aid effect on it at some point and dump some sugar in there. Anyways, we got some lemonade back there for you after service if you want to grab some. And also if you want to give your tithes and offerings today you can check in at the hub afterwards or if you're joining us online we have different ways for you to be able to do that whether it's text to give or on our website or however you choose to do it I'm sure Jeremiah has some options up for you on the screen there and that being said let's go ahead and get into the word this morning you guys ready yeah ready for the word interesting that even during worship, I just felt like there's some things that the Lord kind of wanted to highlight. And oddly enough, they're not even really like the main point of the message, but just some things in passing that I knew the Spirit had had me put in there, but that I really feel like God wants to emphasize to you today. So there's going to be a couple of points that 
we're going to just kind of pause for a second and just let it sink in for a moment that I believe the Lord has some things specifically for um, maybe even just a few individuals to hear this morning in the process of all of this. So let's just pray real quick and, and kind of set our hearts, prepare our hearts to receive what the Holy Spirit has for us today. So, Father, we are thankful, Lord. First and foremost, we are thankful. We understand that there are challenges right now going on. There is, there is um, a lot of things happening, Lord, both in, um, in our culture, in the health of our culture, in the political climate of our nation, God. There is just so much happening right now. And yet, God, in the middle of it, there is still so much that we can be thankful for. So we are thankful, Jesus, we are thankful, first and foremost for the cross, Lord, that you have saved us, that you have delivered us from our sins, but also just the way that you care for us, that you have prepared a place for us, and that, Lord, we are safe in your hands. We are safe in your hands, Lord, and I thank you, God, that you, you, um, you fill in the places where we are weak, Lord. You fill in those gaps, Lord. I was just been thinking about that, Lord, how the areas where we seem to fall so short, Lord, sometimes, and it can even be discouraging to ourselves, Lord, but, but um, your strength is made perfect in weakness, God. Those places where we've messed up or where we're struggling, God, those are just places that make room for your strength. So I thank you for this, Jesus. Anoint this word, Lord, I pray in your name. Amen. So we are in John 17 this week, containing what is often referred to as Jesus' high priestly prayer. So many times we think of the Lord's prayer as the prayer that is our Father which art in heaven, but actually that's a prayer that the Lord gave to us. And really, John 17 would probably be more accurately described as the Lord's prayer. This is the prayer of intercession that Jesus prayed. And it is exactly that. It is Jesus praying and interceding for his believers. And it is just further evidence of Jesus in his role as our mediator. And he is our only mediator. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, and that is the man Christ Jesus. Again, reinforcing his earlier words, that no one comes to the Father except through him. But on that point, and this is already kind of one of those first points of emphasis that I feel like the Holy Spirit was really alerting me to during worship, is this, this idea, this fact of Christ as our mediator. And I felt like the Lord just wanted to speak to you today that Jesus, you know, he is a great mediator, a compassionate high priest, because he knows what you're going through. And I don't know if, there, if there's just somebody who's watching or somebody who's sitting here who is in a particularly like difficult struggle right now, but I feel like the word of the Lord to you is, is that Jesus knows what you're going through. And I know that can sound very general, you know, when you just think of it like that, Jesus knows what you're going through. But there's a different kind of knowledge that the Lord has. There's a different kind of knowledge that the Bible speaks of. Like, even back in Genesis, when it says, man has become like us, knowing good and evil. That word knowing, it doesn't mean just having a knowledge of it, like a head knowledge of it. But it means having experienced it. So when we say Jesus as our mediator knows what you're going through, it's not that he just knows it. Of course, he's God. He's, he's omniscient. He knows all things, right? But it's more than that. He knows what you're going through because he's experienced it. He's experienced it. He's experienced betrayal and heartache, and he's even experienced temptation. He was tempted in all the same ways that we have been tempted yet without sin but he knows it so when i say jesus knows what you're going through jesus not only can um you know there's a difference between sympathy and empathy right 
sympathize is just like, oh, I see what you're going through and um, I feel sorry for you. Empathy is so much deeper than that because empathy means I'm actually feeling what you're feeling right now. I'm going through it with you. I'm empathizing with you. Like if there's somebody who's mourning, right? And you go with that person and there's a different level of just sympathizing with them over their loss or actually empathizing with them and going with that person and grieving through the process with them. You understand what I'm saying? And that's what Jesus does for us. He knows what you're going through. It's not just sympathy, but it's empathy. He's feeling it and he's carrying it with you during this time. So I really felt like the Lord wanted you to hear that. Now, as I said, we're in John 17. And every time you or I go through a book of the Bible, we pick up new things, don't we? I have this time of going through the Gospel of John. I feel like so many new things have opened up for me in this section and in this um, book this time. And I would say one of the main things, especially the last few weeks that has just been jumping out to me over and over, is this idea of relational context. You know, of course, as a person who studies the scripture and has been blessed with the um, calling to share the scripture and try to make it plain to people and try to just bring it in such a way that it's edifying and building the church, context has always been a huge issue to me, whether it's remote, historical context, or immediate context, the surrounding scriptures. But this idea of relational context has been super valuable to me this time going through John. And I think it's valuable for at least a couple of reasons. One is because having it in that context helps us apply ourselves to Scripture and Scripture to ourselves in the right areas. It's not, it's not taking something that was actually given specifically to a different person inside of scripture and saying that's mine even though there are things we can glean from that sometimes but it's actually finding the places where jesus was specifically addressing us the church you know and looking and seeing how those promises fit to us so it's i want the bible to actually work for us right and keeping it in its context, actually knowing when Jesus was specifically speaking to us, it makes the Word of God so much more effective. But also the other thing that has been like greatly valuable for me in doing that is it has illuminated in these past few chapters the deep care and love and friendship that Jesus had for and with his disciples. In particular, the 12 disciples, how deeply committed he was to them. You know, the first, I think it's like the first 19 verses of this John chapter 17. If we really read it correctly as Jesus is praying, he is interceding for the 12. More specifically, the 11. Because he even says, I haven't lost one of them except for the one who is fulfilling that prophecy. Right? But those first 19 verses, Jesus is praying specifically for the 12. And that doesn't make me feel excluded. It actually makes me just wonder at the care and love that Jesus has for those who he was committed to, but who had also made a commitment to him. That as he's preparing to endure the cross, as he's preparing to take on the sins of the world, as he's preparing to go to the grave, right? What is on his mind is the well-being of his friends. So the love that Jesus has for his, for his people is just immense to me. But you and I were on his mind too. And you see that transition at verse 20 of John chapter 17. You should have that on your papers that you were handed out today if you don't have your Bibles with you. So John chapter 17, starting in verse 20, 
it says, my prayer is not for them alone. So keep in mind, he spent the first 19 verses praying for the 12, right? And interceding for them. But then he goes on to say, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. And again, here it comes the part where we fit in. This is the part of scripture that absolutely undoubtedly applies to us. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. And this is not just a generic prayer of covering for any future convert. A convert. It's not like, oh Lord, you know, any of those who believe in me in the future, you know, may this be a blessing for them too. No, I believe that the Lord was praying for us specifically, that at that point, we were already known. He's praying for a people who had already been defined. And that's you and I. We were on Jesus' mind during this time. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Listen to that again. He chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with the with his pleasure and will. You were already on God's heart before the foundations of the world had ever been laid. You'd already been chosen and picked. And, and here's one of those other things that I think is just a point of emphasis. And I know it, it almost sounds silly saying it, but I'll say it anyways, because I feel like the Lord wants me to, but you are pretty special. Everyone who is sitting here right now, even if there were, even if it were possible that somebody were sitting here right now who was not right with the Lord, who had not yet received Christ as their personal Savior, I will tell you that you are here because God has chosen you and He appointed you to be here right in this moment. And He knew it. This God who, yes, is all-powerful, but as we said, He is omniscient, all-knowing not limited by time, time dwelling within him. He knew you before he ever created a thing. He knew you. It's amazing to me how much the Lord loves us. It's also amazing to me when I think of how well God knows me and he still loves me. You know, that means when God chose me, he knew all the horrific sins I would commit. He knew before I received him as my savior, what a blasphemer I was as, as a youth and just, you know, all of the mishaps and everything that I got into. He knew me. He knew it all ahead of time. He knows every mistake I'll ever commit from this point forward. And yet he still, he still chose me and he still chose you and he loves you that much. He loves you that much. So it's not just it's not just the 12 that were on his mind as he's about to face the most difficult thing that anybody has ever faced, right? But you and I were on his mind too. And he says, I'm praying for them. I am praying for them that are going to believe on me through the message. If we pick it back up in verse 22, what is Jesus praying for us? And here we get into the point of this message today in verse 21. He says, I pray for them that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. 
Listen to this verse here. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. That verse 22, it just keeps... Um, it's been really just grabbing me as I, as we go through it. It's, it says, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. And that's a pretty awesome statement, isn't it? Isn't it? That Jesus gave us the glory that the Father had given to him. Think about that. He says, I am giving them the glory that you gave to me. I mean, that's about as awesome of a statement as you can find. And I think about it, it's like I'm blown away by that. Lord, you're giving us the glory that the Father gave to you. But what is the glory? What actually is that? Because that's the part that, you know, I think there's a lot of ideas of what glory is in Scripture. And and maybe a lot of just things that come to our mind when we hear a word like glory. And I always think of God as getting all the glory, right? And yet Jesus says, I am giving them, and we know that he is specifically praying about us right now. He says, I am giving them the glory which you have given to me, that they may be one just as you and I are one. Uh, that is an incredible statement, but for me to really understand that, because if I don't properly understand it, I'm going to get away from that scripture, actually, because I never want to be guilty of touching God's glory. God gets all the glory. And yet here we have the scripture where Jesus says, I'm giving them the glory you gave to me. So what is this glory? Glory can bring a lot of different ideas to our mind so as i said there is the glory which we give god in worship like i think it talks about that in revelation chapter 14 when it tells us what is happening in heaven at that moment and they are saying all glory all honor all praise are yours O lord but listen to that all glory all honor all praise it can't be talking about that same glory right when jesus says i'm giving them the glory you gave to me it has to be distinct from the glory that we give to god and it is distinct it is different from that but what's interesting is that it is the exact same word it is the same word in the original greek for the glory that jesus is giving to us it's the same as the glory that we give back to the Father, that we give to the Father. But it's different. And then there's this, this um, truth in God's Word about what we call the Shekinah glory, right? So what is that? You know, that's something else that comes to our mind when we hear glory. But Shekinah glory is literally the tangible presence of God. That is when the glory of God is in a place in such a way that you literally feel and know and some at times can even see that the presence of God is with you. How many of you have ever experienced the presence of God in that way, right? To where you just literally know it's like I can feel it that God is in this place. I want to tell you it's a little concerning to me that maybe half the hands went up when I said that. I want you to know that you have been given the privilege to come into the presence of the Lord. And that's not just a theological truth. There is a, there is a time when we literally get into the presence of God in such a way where you just know it's like, I feel Jesus in this place, right? I mean... I I think you guys know me well enough by now to know that you know I'm not a um I'm not a overly mystical type person or anything else 
but more times than I could even count, I have felt the wind of God through a room, right? More times than I could even begin to count, not just in church, but even in my own daily prayer closet, whatever it is, I have literally felt the presence of God in a place, right? So you are invited into that, ex into that same experience with the Lord. But that's not what the Lord is referring to as well. It's, it's different than that. Glory is from the Greek word doxa. Doxa. And the literal translation of that word is um, opinion or estimate. That's what it means. And then it's not the type of thing where if you're familiar with the strong, sometimes there'll be seven or eight different definitions for a word and the ones that are least common or further down the list or whatever. No, the number one definition of the word doxa is, is that um, estimate or opinion or actually opinion or estimate of something or someone. That's what it means. So when we're giving God the glory, I was thinking about it in a sense, what we are doing, like when you think about um, if you're spending time in worship and you're giving God the glory, what are you doing? It's like, God, you are worthy of all praise. You are good, Lord. There is none beside you. There is none like you, Lord. You are... You know, you are so good to me. You love me more than we could ever know. God, you are amazing. God, right? What are we actually doing? We're giving God the glory, but this is our opinion, right? It is the opinion that we are expressing of God. And it kind of makes sense. Or an estimate of God. God, you are all powerful. You spoke the worlds into motion. There is nothing that you can't do. Okay, these are accurate estimates of God. We are giving him the glory. So this word doxa, that's what it means. It just means in this sense here, and even in the sense of giving glory to God, it means literally opinion or estimate. And I didn't have time to really follow this through, but one thing that came to my mind is I bet you that this is connected with the word doxology. With the doxology. You know, when I was a teenager, I would go to my friend Shane's church with him. And it was more of a liturgical church, you know, to where they kind of had a, a format. There was like a, you know, a, a list of things that you would do every single week in church. And, um, and it was a community church up there in Mountain Gate. So we would go to service in there and at times you would stand and they'd have you sit then you'd stand back up for a certain part then you'd sit again then you'd stand back up and they had this pastor named jack retzer right and he was an older guy at the time i think he's gone home to be with jesus i'm sure he would be shocked <laughs> maybe not i shouldn't say that but it would be a, a happy surprise for him to find out that i actually became a pastor right because you know, we weren't always the best behaved at the church back then. But Jack Retzer would stand up there and he had this voice like this. He'd talk like this, right? And he'd stand up and he'd say, and now it's time for the doxology, right? Every week, same exact way. And now it's time for the doxology. And then we would sing that song that it, it goes like, and I'm not going to try to sing it for you, but it says, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And you see the truth, right? You see what is being expressed about God in that doxology. That's what I'm saying about giving God the glory. This is the opinion or the estimate. So while it is the same word, it's in a different context here because what is Jesus saying? He is saying, I am extending to them, Father, the same glory that you have extended to me. And what does that mean? He's like, 
He's saying, I'm giving them the same opinion and the same estimate which you have given to me. Right? It's going to be by grace. It's not anything that we could earn. But he's saying the same way, think about it, the same opinion that the father had of his son, Jesus, Jesus, by grace, has extended to us. He says, Father, I'm extending that to them as well. The same estimate that he had of Jesus. We're not worthy of it. We don't deserve it. There's nothing we could do to earn it. And it feels almost scary to even say it because we are so unworthy of it. And yet Jesus, he went to the cross to make it possible. He washed us from our sins with his precious blood. He made the way, but he says, Father, I'm giving that to them. The same thing you said of me. So what is that? What does that look like? I have given them the glory that you gave to me, that they may be one as we are one. Jesus extending that to us. In what way? Well, there's probably more ways than we could even attempt to, to delve into this morning, but we'll pick a few. And I've decided to highlight a few of the main ones that Jesus himself has been highlighting in the previous few chapters all around this. And the first thing that he has extended to us is sonship. That we are all sons and daughters of God. And in John 14, just a few chapters earlier, and we say just a few chapters, but honestly, it's just a few days, right? In the events that are happening here in this final this passion week of Christ, right? In John 14, Jesus made a statement to us. He said that he would not leave us as what? Orphans. He's not going to leave us as orphans. When Jesus says, I'm extending to them the glory which you gave to me, what is the first thing that he is doing? Is he is extending us the right to be children of God. It blows me away that he did that for us. So we have been adopted. And it's not just adopted, but adopted with unity in mind. That he adopted us so that we may be one, even as they are one. And I think this highlights the importance of it being grace. Because it's by God's grace that we have been adopted. And why is that important? Well, it's not because of your talent that God adopted you. It's not because of your looks. It's not because of your wealth. It's not because of your IQ. It's not because of your accomplishments or how hard you work or anything else. It's only by grace that we have had that given to us by Jesus Christ. I am giving them the same glory which you gave to me. It's only God's grace that could do that. And because of that, what we know is God doesn't have favorites. God doesn't love one more one child more than another. He has extended to you the same, the same sonship. It's, it's hard to get your head around, but as a, as a family, like with my family, we have adopted. And I think for us, that's probably one of the, the greatest gifts to us that we've ever had because we understand what adoption is. That when you literally adopt somebody and you have chosen to bring them into your family and you say, this is now my child, you don't favor the biological children over the adopted children or anything like that, right? They're just, now they're your kids. Now this is your kid, right? And Jesus is saying, I've extended that to them. So we have this adoption and it's not based on anything more than God's grace. He doesn't have favorites. Just thinking about it, it's like, you know, like he loves me, he loves you as much as he loves a Billy Graham. You know? It's just God's grace and goodness to us. 
that extended that to us. And if we were valued differently, it would be hard to maintain unity. Remember what he said, so they may be one as we are one. If there were differences or statuses in God's economy, or if he loved one person more than another, or valued one person more than another, there wouldn't be unity in that. There wouldn't be a oneness inside of that, but that's not how God operates. He's no respecter of persons. In fact, what we see when we get involved with it too much is that's when disunity happens because it's hard for us not to play favorites. It's hard for us not to value some people more than others or say, oh, oh, that person, you know, is more valuable to this than this person. That's when we get involved and that's when disunity happens. It's so important what Paul said to us because he didn't tell us to make sure to create unity in the church. He said, maintain unity in the church. Maintain it. What does that mean? God has already created it. By his grace, he's, all, he's already made us sons and daughters, and he's not playing favorites with any of us. There's already unity in the church. Our job is just don't mess it up. Don't start being a respecter of persons or playing favorites because God didn't do that with us. He has extended to us the same opinion and the same estimate as his son Jesus. And if that freaks you out to say it, think of everything that, that Jesus told us during this time. When he said, greater works than these shall you do, right? And it's like, how could I ever do that, right? But this is what Jesus has given to us. He's saying, I have given them the glory which you gave to me. The next thing that Jesus has extended to us is authority. He told us, whatever we ask in his name, he'll do it. So as we live as followers of Jesus, doing the will of the Father, we have authority in Jesus' name. How? Because Jesus has extended that to us. He extended his glory to us. We live as sons and daughters now in Jesus' name with the ability to see miracles, to see miracles and to have prayers answered, right? How many of you, we talked about who's seen the presence of God or felt the presence of God. How many of you seen a real miracle? Maybe a third, maybe, right? God is still the God of miracles. I've seen miracles in my life. I've seen miracles of healing. I've seen miracles of provision. I have seen God do awesome things. This is the authority that Jesus has extended to us. The glory, the opinion, the estimate, right? He has extended to us and he says, and whatever you ask in my name, I'm going to do it. Now I know I know that all of us here have asked for things before and not gotten it. We've prayed prayers before and it hasn't been answered the way that we thought it would be answered. And I would tell you that if we were to take the time to really break down what it means to, to ask for something in Jesus name, it really means to ask for something that is alignment with the will of the father for us in Jesus name. And none of us are perfect. I know we read the scripture and it's like, well, Jesus, he batted a thousand, right? He batted a thousand. So, you know, that must be our right to bat a thousand. Well, Jesus also never missed the mark on what the Father's will was in each and every moment. Jesus was perfect, right? And there's just going to be times where we miss it a little bit. And... And if you don't understand that, you can really start to beat yourself up over it. Like, well, I didn't have enough faith, so this person didn't get healed. Or it was because, you know, I had made a mistake this last week, and that's why God didn't answer this prayer. And it's not that at all. I honestly, I don't believe it's that. I believe it's just sometimes, and there's nothing wrong with asking, 
but sometimes we're asking for something that God has already determined an outcome for. And it's, it's, not to, it's not to make you feel bad or to judge you or to put you down, but sometimes we just don't ask perfectly. What did James say even? And I just thought of this. James said, you have not because you ask not. But then he said, you ask and you don't receive. Why? Because you ask to miss. So sometimes we just kind of miss it with the prayer. Jesus never missed it. But it doesn't diminish the fact that he has extended authority to us. The glory which the Father gave him, he has given to us. And then the, the last thing I want to point out is that we have also been made recipients of Jesus' inheritance. Inheritance. And this is the part that we forget about sometimes because we get so wrapped up in this life and we start to live this life like this is all there is. Every single problem that comes up or every accomplishment or every, every piece of material that we add to our life or whatever, it's like this is what we're all about right now. We're focused on this time. And yet Jesus has an inheritance for us that transcends this world by so much, right? that transcends this life by so much this life is just like a speck compared to what Jesus has prepared for us and compared to what he has offered to us and extended to us. It's, it's just unimaginable. I like to read uh, occasionally, just jump ahead in the book to Revelation 21, just to get the picture again of what we have waiting for us. Caught that one. <laughs> Revelation 21, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city and the new Jerusalem. Listen to these words. And the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. What is the bride of Christ? The new Jerusalem, which we will be part of. And it says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. And he who had, was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. <laughs> I need that. <laughs> I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Jesus has in, extended to us his inheritance. And we have so much that is better ahead of us. So much. The goal now and eternally of all of this is ultimately that we would be one in total unity as they are one. Not that we as Christians are part of a separate whole, like W-H-O-L-E. We as Christians are not part of a separate whole from the Father and the Son. But the plan is is that we are grafted into the whole body as the body of Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, and empowered to do the will of God on this earth. That's what Jesus has given us. That is, the, that is at least the beginning or the surface of the glory which he has given to us, which the Father gave to him. And I'll read these last few verses of the chapter and then we'll close in prayer. It says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. 
that location we just read about in Revelation. And to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. <laughs> we read that about ourselves as well, huh? Because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Amen. And let's pray. Father, I am so thankful for your word. I'm thankful that you sent your son Jesus to this earth. And Jesus, I'm grateful that you made yourself of no reputation, leaving the riches and, and the glories of heaven and coming down and living this life as part of your creation and living as a servant and suffering hardship and loss and all of the things that we have that we have gone through, Lord, so that you could take every sin, every temptation, every weakness to the cross with you, Lord. And now you are our great mediator, our great intercessor, and you have given us so much, Lord. You've extended so much by your grace and your power to us, Lord. People who don't deserve it, Lord, we could never earn it. We could never earn it, God. I thank you for this, Jesus. I pray, Lord, for anybody who is hearing this message, Lord, that if their opinion of themselves and their estimate of themselves has been false, that that will be corrected in Jesus' name. Because, Lord, the opinion and the estimate of us that matters is the one which you gave to us. It's the one that determines who we are in you, Jesus, and how the Father sees us, and how we are regarded by God Almighty. That's the one that matters, Lord. So we thank you for this, Lord. We thank you, God, for sharing that aspect of glory with us. And in return, God, we give you all the glory, all the praise, God. Nobody could do it except for you, God. No one has ever loved us the way that you love us, Lord. Nobody has ever provided for us or cared for us the way that you do. I think of what David said when he said, I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their children begging for bread. Lord, there is none like you the way that you care for us and love for us. So I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you, church. You're welcome to hang out, fellowship. Have some awesome lemonade. It's organic. Local honey and that stuff.